How's everybody feeling today? I'll tell you what, for me, that extra hour of sleep, man, that really, really helped. I hope you feel alive. I hope you're ready to receive the word of God. Let me first introduce myself. If you're new this morning, my name is Adam, and I'm the pastor here. Man, we are so glad that you've joined us here this morning. If you do me a favor after service, we just want to get to know you, tell you more about Journey. If you go right over here uh, to the next steps, and we want to get some stuff in your hand and uh, tell you all about what God is doing here at the church. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what series we're in right now. We're in a series entitled Low Hanging Fruit. And this morning, we're looking at the fruit of faithfulness. The fruit of faithfulness. Let me give you a definition of low hanging fruit uh, this morning. The definition is this easy things that can be most readily done or dealt with in achieving success or making progress towards an objective. Here's the heart behind this series. So often what we do, and it's a tremendous mistake that sometimes we make, we fix our eyes on the gifts of the Spirit instead of the giver of every good and perfect gift, which is God, and it results in this shallow relationship with a loving Father. And so what we do is we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, which then allows us to walk healthily in the gifts of the Spirit that he has given each and every one of us. Can you imagine walking the gifts of the Spirit without love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? It's pretty dangerous to do that. And so our heart behind this series, get back to the basics. Let's learn what it's like to walk in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, these fruits, and then let's walk in what God has given us. This series is going after the fruit that should be so easily obtainable by every person who is a follower of Jesus. Let's read, let's read right now where we find this. This is Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. Let's talk about this fruit of faithfulness that can be so easily lived out when we are connected to Jesus. Before we do that, let's pray. Let's invite the Lord to speak to it through his word to us this morning. God, we thank you for your presence that is here right now in this place. Lord, I pray that, God, you would make your logos word become rhema to our hearts. You would make it alive, oh God. That, Lord, we would learn to live out our lives connected to the vine, connected to you. So then, Lord, we can live out faithfulness to the relationships that we have and Faithfulness to you, Father God. Lord, it only comes when we're connected to the faithful one. So, Lord, would you help us to live it out, Jesus? Lord, I pray and we declare today that, Father God, that, Lord, that we are your servants and we are listening. So, God, I pray this morning, God, that you would speak to every single person in this room for your servants are listening. No one came here this morning to hear a word from me. Lord, Holy Spirit, we all came here to hear from you. We didn't come this morning just to sing some songs, God. But Holy Spirit, we all came here to hear from you. And so, God, I pray that you would breathe upon your word this morning and make it alive. Lord, it is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And, Lord, we love you. We bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How many know that marriages, it can be on the mountaintop sometimes? You can be down in the valley sometimes, right? It's not always rainbows and incredible. It presents its challenging moments, doesn't it? Would anybody disagree with me and say, man, my marriage is always rainbows and, and fantastic and amazing? Oh, man, yeah, let's go, y'all. I'm envious, envious of you. I shouldn't be right now. But marriage has, has its ups and downs. But this is what I love about a marriage relationship, what it should be, is I know that in my marriage... That no matter what, no matter what challenges that I might face at a particular moment in time, 
no matter what challenges we might face together, that Laura's going to be faithful to me and I'm going to be faithful to my wife. Right? No matter what happens, no matter what's going on, I'm going to be faithful to her and she's going to be faithful to me. And there's something about that that just kind of gives you peace. Man, this is the relationship that I have that I know, man, we've got each other's back no matter what's going on, no matter what trials or tribulations we might face. It is an incredible relationship to have in the context of putting God first. I mean, when you put in your marriage, let me just talk about this for a moment. If you, when you put God first individually, everything else just kind of works out. When each person puts God first, your relationship and your marriage is just so much easier. But here's the thing with faithfulness as well. We're also to be faithful in other relationships, right? Faithful towards our spouse, faithful, faithful towards our kids, faithful to our employee or employers, or right? We're to be faithful in our relationships. And if we're to be faithful in these earthly relationships, how much more should we be faithful to God? We're to walk in faithfulness towards God. And here, this, this is the most incredible thing that God, his name is literally faithful. His name is literally faithful and true. Revelation 19.11, John on the Isle of Patmos, he has this vision. And he, and he says this, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. Say Faithful and True. Faithful. Come on, say it with some passion right now. Faithful and True. You see, when we are connected to the faithful one, God gives us grace to be faithful in our relationships. And one day we will meet, we're literally, this is so incredible when you really realize this and you begin to understand it. We're literally going to meet with God face to face one day. Like we're going to stand before him. Like the, the one who created the universe, the one who holds the water in his hands, the one who made it all, who formed it all, who formed even you in your mother's womb, who knew you way back when eternity passed. We're going to encounter this God one day. And this is the, he's going to judge us, not on our successes, not on what we know intellectually or education. He's going to judge us based off of how faithful we were with what we had been given. Were we faithful? Did we steward what was given well? Were we faithful stewards of our lives? Let's define faithfulness. The fruit of faithfulness is defined as trustworthiness and steadfastness of character in the life of a believer. The Greek word for this fruit faithfulness that we see here is the word pistis, which means belief and trusted. So those who are faithful are dependable, and you can put their trust in them. But there is no person that's more faithful than our God. He is our best example of faithfulness. He will never break his promises to you. Paul reminded his friend Timothy of this. He wrote and he said to him in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, God will remain faithful. Think about that. When you are not faithful to God, God still remains faithful to you. Faithfulness is his very nature. You can absolutely trust him at his word. And not doing so is outside of the realm of, of possibilities. He will always be faithful because he's the same God today as he was yesterday. And he will be forever. He's an unchanging God. He does not vary. His character does not change. He is steadfast and he is faithful and he is true. We serve a God who is for you, not against you. We serve a God who is faithful towards you. And God wants us to be faithful like him. And as with the producing of all the fruits of the spirit, this is possible only when we stay connected to Jesus. Only when we're connected to Jesus, we are to be faithful. This is what I know. That we need to be faithful personally, but also what does faithfulness look like for us as a church? I want to speak on that just for a moment here. What does faithfulness look like for us as a church? I felt like many a year and a half ago or so that the Lord just really laid it on my heart that the scripture that in the last days is going to pour out a spirit upon all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see dreams. Old men will see visions. And that it was my job to prepare this house 
for an authentic move of God. I don't want to be about emotion, y'all. Emotion is only good for a moment. But I want an authentic relationship with Jesus where we are encountering him daily. We're encountering him daily through the word of God. We're encountering him daily through prayer. We're encountering him in this part of our vision, and how we say it in, in, in our vision, is that we want to take these corporate encounters with God and then they would lead to daily personal encounters with God. Because it's not about just coming to church and having an emotional high and then going home and just living your lives the way you want to. What is the point, right? We want to live faithful lives to God. And as we do that, as we lead and have these corporate encounters, lead us to daily personal encounters with God, and we have daily personal encounters with God, this will then result in these corporate encounters with God where God just takes over the room. We experience his manifest presence. I mean, where can you go from his presence, the Bible says. If I go up to the heavens, he's there. If I go down to Sheol, he's there. You know, there's nowhere we can, we can escape the presence of God. But what I'm talking about is a manifest, tangible presence of God. And as a church, we're here gathering around him, not gathering around a message, not gathering a song, but we're gathering around his presence. And so what I believe is God has placed a mantle upon this church to carry his presence to this world. In a culture that is made messed up, going every which way, we are to faithfully steward his presence. Amen? And as we steward faithfully, we will see a harvest. But the enemy, what do we know? The enemy hates a harvest. He won't attack what is not a threat at producing fruit. He won't attack a dead marriage. He won't attack a dead church. He won't attack a business in decline. And I feel that we are on the edge of a harvest, a great harvest that God is moving and working in this time, in this season. And it's time to ready ourselves. It's time to prepare ourselves. It's time to put on the armor of God and remain faithful to the work that he has called you individually to do and we as a church to do. Amen. And the enemy, he's so cunning, he's so smart. What he will do is he'll try to take you out before you even arrive at the promises that God has given you. He'll try to get in and shift your mind and shift your focus and tell you lies. He will try to destroy what he has promised to his people before it even arrives. But what are we going to do? We're going to have resolve, right? We're going to know that, man, God is walking with us. He's going to give us the strength to see us through. We must be aware that each day is a battle. Luke 12, 35. It says this, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. One translation says, be dressed and ready for active service and keep your lamps continuously burning. So let's talk about this last part. Your lamp's continuously burning. What, do, what does that mean? How do we keep our lamps burning? What do we do? I want to give you Psalm 1828. It says this, you, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. When we are connected to Jesus and we're living every moment for him, because what, is every moment supposed to be worship unto him? We're, li- we're connected to Jesus through his word and through prayer and through worship, spending time with him. What happens there's a, there's a flame that ignites in our heart that just burns for him, that you just want to spend time with him, that you can't help but to wake up and just spend time with him and spend time with Jesus. And what it takes, guys, is it takes consistency. Can you be faithful? Can you be consistent in that time? Day after day, what ends up happening after two weeks, after three weeks of just being consistent, day after day, when you, when you miss a day, don't beat yourself up. Just get yourself back up and say, man, I'm going to continue forward and spending time with Jesus. And as you do that, there's something that ignites where you cannot help but to want to spend time with Jesus. And then what happens is when you spend time with Jesus and you have this lamp and this flame that's burning, man, you can't help but to share the gospel with someone. There's a world, and you know people who, who, who are lost, who don't know Jesus. And you can't help but to share the gospel with someone who doesn't know him if you've been spending time with the Lord. It's not out of, man, I'm a Christian, so i got to do my due diligence, i gotta, I got to do this thing. No, it's not out of willpower then. What is it? It's out of, man, I just love Jesus. i got to share about the one I love. That's it. We've got to keep our lamps burning. 
Because then we can attack the darkness with the light that is within us. Back to Luke 12, 35, be dressed and ready for active service. What does that mean? It's living out Ephesians 6 by daily putting on the armor of God that he's given us. You see, in these times when the enemy is attacking churches and families and relationships and our children, he is literally trying to steal our children. He's trying to get into this next generation. You go look at Disney and they're just kind of seeping things in at times, trying to make what is sinful become normal and the norm for kids. He is trying to bring confusion and make the next generation believe that bad things are actually good and good things are actually bad. That love is love. Or love is God. No, I'm sorry. God is love. Or that a woman is a man or a man is a woman. No, a woman is a woman or a man is a man, right? Or that you can be genderless or binary. What is the heck is going on with society? We have to put on the armor of God and pray for our kids and not allow this culture to deceive them. Or the feelings, I mean, we think that our emo- this is the great deception of today, that we'll believe that our emotions and our feelings are truth. We think because we felt a certain way that we'll listen to our emotions and that is truth. I'm sorry, the only truth is this word. The only truth is this. It is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. If you're feeling a certain way about something, go to the word of God. Don't go to some kind of emotion or some kind of feeling that you think that you have. Yeah, you might have, you might feel that way. But man, allow the word of God to work on you. Don't listen to your emotions, your feelings. Listen to this. It is dangerous when we start listening to our emotions or our feelings and not in the word. Because you'll allow the, you'll allow the emotions in the culture of the day to tell you something that is not true. And you'll walk away and you'll miss out on what God is doing in your life. We listen to the word, it is truth, and it's lamp into our feet and a light into our path. We've got to be faithful to put on the armor of God every single day. And we can't afford not to. This is found in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. How? It's not going to be through you, is it? Or out of willpower or anything that you do, what is it going to be? It's going to be through the Holy Spirit. Through the power of his might, not your might. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. If we think that we wrestle, we're wrestling against flesh and blood right now, we are incredibly deceived. But what we wrestle against? Against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, here's what we must do. Here's what we must know to do. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, Verse 15, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all the perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We have to know if we're going to be successful in this cosmic battle that is coming against us. You need to understand you'll need to have the armor of God. You'll need to have the armor of God. To not understand or think that you don't is prideful. And at the very least, it's foolishness. We need to understand we have to from the armor of God. And God is calling his people to be faithful warriors in this battle. How many faithful warriors do I have in this battle? Come on. Yeah. Be faithful warriors in this battle who stand up for what is right, what is true. But here's the key, y'all. It's with love. With love. With love. We stand up for what is right, what is true. We don't attack. What do we do? We do it with love. Love, love, love. I want to make a little bit of a shift now. I want to talk about 
the parable of the talents for the remaining of our time. And I want to give you four truths about faithfulness from the parable of the talents. Matthew 25 is where we find this. Let's read this together. Matthew 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. Verse 18, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. Say faithful. faithful. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look there, you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own interest. Verse 28. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given and he will, be, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have even what he has will be taken away. And cast, this is a sobering verse right here, verse 30, and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want to give you four things this morning on this parable and the story that Jesus told. Number one this morning, God gives everyone different gifts to be faithful with. God gives every single person different gifts to be faithful with. Matthew 25, 15. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his own ability. Every single person is unique. In this parable, the master determined the amount of talents given based off of how capable they were to handle the talents. The master was really concerned with one thing. The master was concerned with how faithful they were with what they had been given. Now, some have the idea, we might have the idea that God rewards those who have incredible gifts and talents and who do, uh, who do successful things, but no, God is a rewarder of those who are faithful with what has been given God rewards us according to our faithfulness. Are we developing our gifts? Are we investing what he has given us? Or are we holding it tightly and holding it to ourselves? You see, God will never say, I wish that person had that gift and they'd walk in this. You see, no, God doesn't compare us with someone else. He's not a, a God who compares you with anyone else. We do not have the same talents, abilities, or gifts as others. However, we do possess the same ability to be faithful with what we have. Number two this morning. The faithful receive more responsibility. The faithful receive more responsibility. Back about a a year ago in September, we were uh, leaving a church parking lot on a Wednesday night. It was 8.30, and 
It had been a long day. I had a lot of meetings and stuff, and I was leaving the church with my kids, and it was after um, youth and, uh, and, and uh, journey kids and what they do on Wednesday nights and all that. And uh, as I was leaving the parking lot, I was one of the first ones out, and they, uh, there was a person who dropped off a dog crate across the street. I was like, what in the world are they doing? And, and Ruth sees this. Caleb sees this. And I'm thinking to myself, this is kind of weird. Next thing I know is they run over. <laughs> they open up the dog crate. And there's a dog that starts running out. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not picking up this dog. Because the next thing I know is this car begins to speed off and go the other direction. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? Why are you leaving your dog here? And of course, they were trying to leave it for someone at the church. And Ruth is like, Daddy, we have to stop and pick up this dog. And I'm like, no, no, we're not, we're not picking up a dog right now. I'm not taking this thing home with me. Because we all know that once we pick up a dog and we take it home with us, what's going to happen? It's going to stay with us. So I'm like, man, someone else at church is going to be blessed by this dog. They're going to have it. It's going to be good. Like, it's free. Usually, I always kind of always say this, man, free is for me, but not in the case of a dog. Because I already have a dog. And so what do we do? We end up picking up the crate and taking the dog home, and man, Ruth is really excited about this dog, and Caleb's, Caleb's, you know, cool, we got another dog, and we already, I'm like, we already got one, that's my dog, and I don't need another dog in the house, and we take it home, the next thing I know is this dog is peeing everywhere and pooping everywhere, and I'm like, man, my goodness, like, I, I, I don't need this thing, and so, hey, this is the dog that we picked up, really cute, and of course, when you look at it, I'm like, man, it has my heart already, I'm like, my goodness, and so what I begin to do is Ruth thinks this is her dog. And I'm like, no, Ruth, baby, it's not your dog. I'm, I'm going to give this dog away because once it started peeing and pooping in my house, I'm like, no, 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 we're not keeping this dog anymore. <laughs> and so I begin to look for a family that's good within the church to take in. We actually end up giving it away. But, so fast forward about two days when I find a family to give it away to. Really great family. Yeah, the Eads actually, right on. <laughs> so... I'm like, Ruth, you can't even take care of your, or, or the dog that we currently have. You're not taking it for walks. You're not feeding this dog. We can't take care of another dog because you're not responsible for the one that we already have. So I line it up, and I don't really tell her that someone's come to pick it up. My bad, my mistake. The next thing I know is that they come to pick up the dog, and she's still thinking that this dog is hers. When I've told her all along, this is not going to be your dog, babe. And when they come to pick up the dog, she just starts boo-hooing, crying, like just this <laughs> ugly cry. And I'm like, baby, it's, it's okay. Like, this was never our dog. We were trying to rescue and give it to a good family. And I couldn't take it. So Laura's out of town when this is happening on a Friday night. <laughs> She's at a women's conference in Charleston with some friends. And so I'm looking at my daughter. And she's boo-hoo and crying for like literally 30, 30, 45 minutes on a Friday night after this dog had left and we gave it away for a great family. And um, I'm, I did the only thing logical that, you know, a loving father would do. I, I mean, ice cream would be a good one, but that's actually, I took her to the Orange Park Mall and we began to look at other dogs. I mean, <laughs> I, I couldn't, I could not handle her crying like this. And the next thing I know is she has this huge smile on his face. I'm like, baby, why don't you pick out a dog? You know, like, and then mind you, Laura's out of town. She doesn't know that I'm looking at this and doing this. <laughs> and so she picks out this little small, this is a dog that she picks out. I went back and looked at pictures. And so I get to the cash register. I'm literally about to buy this dog. <laughs> and Ruth, man, in her wisdom, she says, Daddy, you should really ask Mommy about this. <laughs> And I'm thinking that moment, yeah, baby, you're probably right, but you know what? She's going to be really excited about it. And Ruth, man, she is like, do it by the book. She's going to, and she gets her, uh, and I'm kind of a little bit like, hey, let's just go with it to see what happens kind of thing. And she goes, Daddy, we cannot buy this dog right now. And I'm like, okay, um, let's text Mommy. So this is the picture I text her. I said, hey, hey, Laura, let's, I'm getting Ruth this dog. You know, she was crying and everything else, and I decided to, uh, to get her this. I haven't checked out yet, but are you cool with it? And she texts back, absolutely not. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're absolutely right. So what do I do? We go and get ice cream instead. <laughs> Ever since then, though, Ruth, man, she's been wanting a dog. 
And I've been telling her, Ruth, until you take care of the dog that we have, until you're responsible for what you have, I am not getting you another dog. I'm not going to be fooled by your crying anymore. <laughs> she's been wanting this, do- this dog, but it's not until she's able to walk in the responsibility with what has already been given to her. Yeah? Matthew says this, Matthew 25, 21, and 23, well done. Good and faithful servant, you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. The two servants who were faithful with their talents received more responsibility. And the one who was unfaithful with what was given to them, the responsibility was taken away from them. In God's kingdom, responsibility is given to those who can handle it, who steward it, who are faithful with it. Responsibility is given to those whose attitude is humble. Responsibility is given to those who work hard with what they have. Responsibility is given to those that remain faithful in the process, even when things are difficult. And if you are faithful in responsibility, you will get a return, which leads me to point number three this morning. Only people who invest faithfully get a return. Only people who invest faithfully get a return. Matthew 25, 29. For everyone who has will be given more. And he will have an abundance. Farmers, they know that they have to plant a seed in the ground. And by faith, they plant that seed in the ground. What do they do? They water it. They tend it. They take care of it. And then, as they're faithful with that, they'll see a harvest. But if they're not faithful with tending to the seed and taking care of it, what happens? Their fields are then filled up with weeds instead. It's the principle of of, of use it or lose it. It's a parallel principle in the kingdom of God. If you have a a gifting, a talent that God has given you, and you're not using it for his glory and for his renown and for his fame, what will happen? You will not get a return. What will happen? You'll find yourselves just uneasy. You'll find yourself miserable even. Because you're not using your gifting and your talent for Jesus, for him. I've known people, I've known, I have a really close friend uh, that we've been best friends since we were like 16 years old. We started playing worship bands together and all this. He came over to the house maybe about um, this past summer, early on. His, him and his wife were going to uh, Disney. And he stopped by and I was asking him, hey, we haven't really caught up in a while. It's been a, it's been a long time. He lives in Texas and all that. I was asking, so what you doing with, with worship? Are you still leading worship and all this kind of stuff? And the, the guy is like absolutely incredible. He can just flat out sing and, uh, and play the piano like just an incredible musician. And he says, no, nah, I haven't sang in f- forever. And I'm like, dude, why, why aren't you using your talents and your giftings for God? What's going to end up happening if he doesn't steward that gift? He's going to lose it. I've known, I've known business leaders who have the gift of making money. But they keep that gift for themselves and they don't give back for the kingdom of God. What ends up happening is they just become miserable because they're taking and receiving. All all that they're doing is just for them and not giving it back for the kingdom of God. You see, we have to be stewards and be faithful with what God has given us. Amen? It reminds me of Colossians 3.24. Whatever you do, work at it with what? With all your heart. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Absolutely everything that you do is for the glory of God. It is not for you to look good. It is not for you to receive any kind of reward here on earth. Because one day as you're faithful and stewarding what God has given you, I mean, God will give you reward in heaven. But if you're stealing that reward here on earth to be made known and be famous, whatever else might be, to get approval from other people, I mean, you're missing out on the reward when you get to heaven. Do not know what your right hand does with your left hand, right? May we be faithful. May we be faithful in stewarding what God has given us. May it be only done Absolutely, just for the glory of God. Man, if you, if you flip burgers for a living, 
Man, do it for all for the glory of God. Like, go on YouTube and learn how to do it the best you possibly can. If you're a waitress, man, serve the people you're called to serve in that moment and do it all for the glory of God. If you were a business leader, man, run your business with absolute integrity and do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do in every single moment, do it all for his glory and his renown and his fame. It is all for him. He has given it to you, your gifts and your talents, to be used for his glory and not yours. It is all for him. The fourth thing we can learn from this parable is people who were unfaithful with God's talents are punished. People who are unfaithful with God's talents are punished. Matthew 25, 28 and 30. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. And throw that worthless, this is super sobering, y'all, listen to this. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The servant who had one talent did nothing with it except bury it, forget it, and go on with his life. His master called him lazy and wicked. He could have at least deposited it with the bankers and received some interest, but he didn't even have the discipline to do it. And because of his failure, he was punished. This might be you right now. You may be saying, Adam, I feel like a failure right now. I haven't been using my gifts and my talents and what God has given me for his glory. Maybe you're in here right now and you're submitting to yourself, man, I've been doing it for me to be known versus Christ to be known. Maybe you haven't been serving at all. Maybe you've just been sitting on the sidelines. But the first step that you must take in realizing, man, I haven't been using my talents and my gifts for God's glory is admitting that you haven't been doing so. Because what can we do? This is... It's an ongoing principle that we can always improve. We can always get better. Galatians 4.19. I love what Paul wrote right here. I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. The Greek word for formed is morpho. Morpho means the inward and real formation of the essential nature of a person. You see, Paul would agonize until Christ was formed in these believers. His concern was that they would demonstrate the character or the fruit of Christ. Following Jesus is a journey. You will be constantly transformed, become more like him. The more time you spend with him, the more you will be like him. This is my challenge to you today. Be faithful daily in spending time with Jesus, which will lead you to easily live out the fruit of the Spirit. It's easy to be faithful when you're connected to the faithful one. Let me end where we begin. Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. It's easy to be faithful when you're connected to the faithful one. Would you rise with me?